Okay, would the housing director please come forward? Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Uh, could you please state your name for sure. the Sure. My name is Jun Yang. I'm the Executive Director for the Mayor's Office of Housing. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Director Yang, for being here. Uh, Director Yang, can you please uh, tell the committee uh, where the administration is at currently uh, with your comprehensive affordable housing analysis, first of all? Second of all, could you also uh, discuss where the administration is currently at in regards to implementing an affordable, uh, a housing first initiative? Sure. So um, currently, uh, we are working together with all departments regarding our um, island-wide housing policy. Um, our departments, Department of Planning and Permitting, especially uh, with Budget Fiscal Services, uh, Department of Community Service, uh, Customer Community Services, we're getting together to create a comprehensive of, uh, island-wide uh, policy to look at how we can implement, uh, um, create more affordable housing for our working families and for those in, in lower income. Um, and we will be coming before the City Council uh, sometime in the future to be able to discuss this uh, about our policies very soon. Uh, regarding our Housing First, um, through the, you know, as, as I've, I've come and spoken to the Council before, our point in time count has given us uh, an idea of how many homeless that we have on our street at, at any given time. Um, from that, we have come to realize that our, our uh, highest population of our chronically homeless individuals are in Waikiki, downtown Chinatown, and in the Waianae Coast area. Uh, for these reasons, we have chosen to focus our Housing First uh, uh, initiative in these three areas. Uh, working with the Department of Community Services, uh, we are trying to get, we are working to get our, our RFP out uh, as soon as possible, and that will be um, sometime in October. The target for the RFP um, is our chronically homeless individuals because that is the, um, uh, the population of our homeless uh, that are on the street that need the most resources um, and also do, are the most vulnerable. And our service provider network, um, they do their best to provide services for all the homeless that are on the street and in shelters. Uh, this is a population that um, not because they are not wanting to, but because the resources have not been, the tools have not been available to them until now to be able to uh, specifically help and administer um, housing services and case management uh, services for this population. So that is the reason why we've chosen this population to work with. Uh, Director Yang, is what part of the plan does the administration plan to roll out in August? The reason I asked that our understanding was that the administration uh, does have a plan to roll out part of what is being considered in the month of August. Can you share that with the committee? Mm. Sure. This is the, the director for the Department of Community Services. Good morning, Pam Whitty Oakland, Department of Community Services. Good morning. Um, Chair Anderson and council members, we are working on our RFP, which will be issued in August, and we will have a contract with a provider. Our target date is to have a contract with a provider for Housing First in October. So the RFP will be rolling out in August, okay? And that's where we are at this moment. Okay, so the RFP will be issued in August. You expect to have a contracted provider uh, by the time the month of October is over. That is correct. And we've been, the, the providers are very aware and anticipating the um, RFP. Okay. Thank you very much. Members, any questions for the administration? Council Member Pine. Is the RFP for just one area or the three areas that were mentioned earlier? It's for all three. Um, wanted to ask Director Yang a couple more questions sure. to follow up on your testimony. So what is the point in time count currently? The point in time Why? count is an annual, uh, I'm sorry, didn't no, What is the point in time count? Okay, the point in time count is an annual process that our entire island community goes through. This is... Uh, I know what it is, but what is the count? Oh, the count, sorry. Uh, for, the, um, for the island, for our homeless population is 4,712 individuals. Uh, our sheltered, unsheltered population, 1,663 individuals. And uh, for our chronically homeless, 
unsheltered, which is a, a subsect, uh, sub population, would be um, 558 individuals. Um, you know, yesterday, the, at the state capitol, state legislators mm -hmm. had a meeting uh, about the housing crisis that we have in Hawaii, yes. and they said there's an estimate that we were going to need 50,000 units statewide in two years for affordable housing. So with uh, this RFP, how many housing units do you think that the city will be able to provide? Well, let me speak to the, um, the study that was done. It's the SMS study that was commissioned by HHFTC back in, in 2011. Um, at that study, at that time, uh, they projected from 2011 till 2016 that the demand for this island would be 50,000 units. Uh, if we were to say that, uh, that it's a static number or it's a, that from today till 2016 we need to achieve those 50,000 units, it would be a, a difficult thing to do. And I think it's, um, uh, we'll have to, we have to realize it's a five-year plan. They are looking at it from 2011 to achieve uh, housing the demand by 2016 would be to look at it uh, to house 50,000 people. Um, our RFP, I'll let, I'll let um, our director, Pam Woody Oakland, speak to that. So the, the question, just to repeat the question, <coughs> how many housing units will we be able to provide exactly. with this RFP? The RFP will provide uh, uh, rental assistance vouchers for up to 100 individuals. Mm -hmm. So kind of short of the 50,000 that we need. Yeah. Well, if we're looking at just 50,000, that's across all the income uh, categories, all the way up to 140,000. Uh, I believe it's up to just the housing demand. Um, the, the need for our chronically homeless, the, the only information that we have is the point in time count. That point in time count tells us about 558 individuals at any given time need um, this housing intervention of Housing First. Housing First is um, the permanent supportive housing combined with intense case management for those who have the highest need. So we're still kind of short because mm -hmm. we're only going to provide 100 and we have 558 that need this type of housing. So. Councilmember, the Housing First is designed for the homeless and the chronically homeless. The study that you're referencing is a need for housing across the board of all many a much broader population and i think we spoke earlier about the city's island-wide policy to develop and encourage more affordable housing i think that's the bigger picture that lines up with that statistic that you're referencing um, our efforts to the rfp is strictly our three million dollars in our operating budget specifically targeting chronically homeless i mean we do have other monies in our cip pro um, budget that will provide some additional housing units. We are, that's still a work in progress. We're doing our due diligence and we'll be prepared to report to you at a later date on that piece of it. So we're still short about 458 housing units for housing first or the chronically homeless. So are there efforts to work with the state government to fill that gap? Absolutely. Um, and what we've come to find is that data um, is the most important thing that we need at this to find the real need. Uh, the point in time count is something that's done January 22nd, around that time, uh, end of the month in January every year. Uh, it incorporates using both service providers and uh, volunteers to go into as many places as possible to find our homeless on the street and in the shelter. Now the questions may not be as, um, uh, as comprehensive as when we do our coordinated assessment, the tool that I had mentioned at the last council hearing. Um, this is the VI SPADAT, the Vulnerability Index uh, tool. This tool will allow the service provider community to know what is the real need and how can we meet that need. What we've come to find after about 525 assessments so far, uh, I believe there's more than that today, but at the last uh, report back that I received um, last week, 525 assessments we have 30% of that need needs housing first. Uh, that would be the, the correct and right intervention for this population uh, of our individuals on the street. Uh, so we're looking at approximately 150 individuals would need, uh, 160 individuals would need housing first. We would be meeting a large portion of that need. The state also has their housing first contract signed um, and 
I believe it's approximately 85 uh, housing units are incorporated in that, uh, that contract. Um, you would have to speak with uh, Lori Suhaku, who is uh, the uh, administrator at, at HPO, uh, the Homeless Programs Office, to get a better understanding of that contract. But I believe it's somewhere around 85 units. So we are meeting much of that need so far. Yeah. Thank you. Vice Chair Harry Moore. Thank you. Um, you're all aware of my opposition to these bills, so I won't go there. Um, so regarding the point in time count, how many of those homeless are in Waikiki? Through the point in time count, uh, the most recent point in time count, the um, uh, off of uh, what I remember of the report, it was uh, approximately 70 individuals from that report up to, depending on where the lines are, up to about 120 individuals. Um, you would have to go into the specific individuals in the, the uh, appendix of it, but it was uh, approximately up to 120 people. Okay. So where, where are the most, mo where do most of the chronic homeless live currently? It, they're in Chinatown, downtown, Waikiki, um, the East Oahu, considered, and in Waianae, yes. The chronic homeless? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Director Oakland, um, one month ago at a committee meeting right here, um, I really apologize. I, I, I'm so disturbed by what we're trying to do here that... You know, I, I, one of my rare moments that I really went after the administration on this, but um, you know, I'm concerned now that we're hearing at that time, one month ago, the administration said we would have things in place in August. And I said, there's no way, and that's when I really started to get after the administration. Today we're hearing that the RFP will go out in August, but you're targeting October for the contract. So, of course, nothing can be done until you have the contract in place. That's so, correct. am I hearing now, one month later, we're saying nothing will happen until October at the earliest. Is that correct? Yes, and if I, I could elaborate. We have, we have a commitment to participate with the state's SAMHSA grant. This is a federal grant that the State Department of Health has for chronically homeless who are severely mentally ill and also um, suffering some, from substance abuse. We have a commitment to partner with them on 10 vouchers. We expect it, and, and they're under contract. However, their providers are not ready to totally implement, so that's the delay we're experiencing. We have that commitment. We anticipated when we had that conversation with you earlier that they would be ready to hit the ground running, and we're encountering some delays there. So rather than give you data that's relying on someone else's contract, I'm telling you what we will do with our own contract. Okay, and that actually was kind of my point. You know, I'm what sure. is within our control? This 10 unit, by the way, 10 is far short of 100, but, um, you know, that's not within our control. We don't know what will happen with those 10 units. And I think it was a mistake for us to even count on that. But clearly, what is within our control is our city efforts with the RFP that you are planning to issue in August. And now you're saying... The contract targeted for October, but here's the real question. When are we actually going to have units in place? What is the commitment that we will have things in place ready to go? We are operating on a parallel path. We are, um, Mr. Yang in, is attending various community organizations and outreaching to realtors and property owners to develop those relationships. Our providers, we meet with our providers on a monthly basis as well. Those who are currently um, utilizing the voucher programs that are other HUD funded programs with funded by our department, they have existing relationship with landlords. They are talking to the property owners to, in, to continue to cultivate those relationships and be aware of units as they come online. It's a function of getting the contract signed and getting the money on the street so that they can actually implement. But those relationships exist. We have over 600 shelter plus. Yes, that's right. 
it's over 600 Shelter Plus Care vouchers that are already out in the community and it's a very similar, it's, it's a different name but it's a very similar program to Housing First that have been out there for many years. And so it's those relationships with existing property owners will be, we continue to cultivate those relationships and look for additional capacity. I appreciate those efforts but you didn't answer the question. Exactly so. what day it's going to be a function of when the contract is signed and sealed and they can make a commitment to and enter into a lease with the landlord. Okay, so here's, here's my concern that one month ago it was August, one month later now today we're saying October for contract signing, but we still have no target date of when those units will be online. Is that oh. correct? That's correct, and, and I, I wish I could give you a more absolute answer. We have a procurement process to go through. If our procurement process got challenged in any way, that's additional delays. It's a function of getting a valid contract signed and ready to implement. Um, the providers are all working now, as we've been talking, for, Mr. Yang has been explaining for a long time. They've agreed to a common assessment tool. They've already assessed individuals. They've been identified. Um, we have the the housing first residents or tenants ready and available and identified. Um, the relationships are there with the landlords. It's really a matter of having an executed contract so we can move forward. And I understand and I appreciate your response. I understand the process. But again, when we, if we approve this bill, 42, targeting Waikiki, I'm assuming the mayor will sign it. The way it's worded is, it is effective immediately. I understand. Assuming we're on course with approving this bill in August, perhaps, we're nowhere near being online with these units. We are so, not, I'm sorry, excuse me. So that was my whole argument last month. If we are saying we need to approve this bill to make it illegal to lie and sit on sidewalks because we need to have this compassionate disruption to force homeless into these appropriate shelters without our units online, they have nowhere to go. And that was my whole argument against doing this immediately. So the follow-up question then is, just to get this on the record now, there's, we know that there's many different types of homeless people, there's different causes of homelessness. But talking about the chronic homeless, if we pass this bill effective immediately with no, none of our housing first units online, they will get arrested. They have no money for paying the fine. They have no money for bail. They will be in jail. They'll have a criminal record. How is that going to help them? The one opportunity that we do have available is shelter capacity. We do have some capacity in our emergency shelters, and that is the only opportunity or option we have to offer. But they exist today. They do. And the homeless are not there. So you think passing this law will cause them to go into a shelter? I think that this is one tool of a very comprehensive effort that we're all embarking on to address the problem. And I may not be able to give you an absolute answer today on when we're going to have Housing First in place, but I can tell you that we're all very committed to implementing as many possible tools as we can to address the comprehensive problem. This is a, a tool in our toolbox. We've been advised by providers that this is something that will have an effect, a positive effect, on helping individuals make a decision to move into alternate sheltering. So what about the chronic homeless who have severe issues with mental capacity or perhaps severe <coughs> substance abuse addictions? What will they do? They cannot be accepted into many of the traditional shelters. Where will they go? The only capacity for them would be the state SAMHSA grant that's already under contract. Which is in, in place. Which is not in our purview okay, to control. Okay, thank you. Point thank taken. you. I yes, think sir. I made my point. Thank you very much. Council Chair Martin. i just keep my questions brief, Chair, because I know there's a lot of people here to testify on this particular matter. 
you know, either one of you can a answer these questions. So. I'll try not to be repetitive of other questions being asked. Is the city's position that uh, we're in a crisis? Yes or no? Yes, sir. I think we agree that okay. we have a severe problem that needs to be addressed. It was just a yes or no question. So the answer is yes. Given that we are in a crisis and with with powers reserved from, from the, within, the, within the mayor and the mayor's close working relationship with the governor, have we talked to the state procurement office about getting a waiver so we can immediately move forward on some of these initiatives that you, you are considering? Has any discussion occurred? We have had some discussion at our level. I don't know that it's gone beyond, no, not to my knowledge. Let me, my, not to my knowledge. So although we recognize that this is a crisis, we haven't moved forward and seen if we can exercise any type of emergency powers reserved for the governor or the mayor so that we can move more quickly sooner rather than later. I can tell you that we have had some of those conversations within the city at looking Just what our options are. That's but correct. But ultimately it requires some type of waiver from the state procurement office, right? We are aware of that, yes. Okay. But none of those discussions have occurred to date. It's an ongoing conversation. Okay. So probably after October then, when the RFP is awarded or released. Is that, is that, or are we awarding contracts at that time? Because if you initiate the discussions now, by the time we settle on a potential waiver, contracts are already awarded. It makes no sense. Well, why, why are we waiting? You know, I can recognize uh, the ambitions of the administration to do 100 rental vouchers, but that's far. Uh, insufficient for I think the number that are out there I don't think we're going to make much of an impact and I think it's going to get it's going to be difficult to find a hundred units with such a short time frame I think given a longer period of time that that's an achievable goal but I, I recognize that the hundred rental vouchers are only for within this particular fiscal year so going forward how many more rental vouchers are we going to look to it uh, secure beyond this fiscal year because potentially if we only looking at a hundred potentially or hypothetically we may only serve a hundred again the following fiscal year because they're not going to be required to move out within the next 12 to 18 months right that is correct in order to sustain the program it's going to be, we're spending three million it's going to cost us three million dollars to house and provide services for a hundred individuals for one fiscal year so that commitment needs to continue next year because that's the commitment we're making and to the extent we want to house additional persons we need additional funding on top of that um, the longer range plan is the CIP projects that have been funded and to provide rental units that are city owned and operated to help reduce the uh, voucher cost but still you've got the supportive services piece that's an ongoing expense. So it's, it's a long-term commitment and it's going to take us until year three or four where we have, or year three where we have additional inventory to be able to start to reduce the programmatic expenses in the operating budget. Okay, so if we're looking at $3 million for 100 units per se, so that's about 30000 potentially per individual that's about, going to cost yes. us. So very significant. Now, recognizing as these bills move forward, you know, initially I've, I've supported these bills, but I, I have the same concern as Council Member Harimoto. You know, you're going to take an assertive approach as this, but you have no other viable alternative other than these 100 rental vouchers and to take such assertive action with no other type of accommodations for the population that we need to relocate because of this situation. You know, it'd be difficult for me, I think, to continue to support these measures. Given that, what other um, alternatives are being discussed within the administration for more immediate uh, contingencies should we adopt these measures? We have had some other preliminary discussions. I'm not at liberty to get it. We're, it's, it's exploratory. I don't have any more de detail for you, but we have been working with the state. So when we talk about our capacity of 100, the state SAMHSA grant and the state's Housing First model, we actually have capacity for almost 200 individuals, which is roughly half of the chronically homeless population that we're talking about. The population at Kakaako, is that chronically homeless? 
Honestly, I can't speak to that. I don't know what they've been indexed and what they are. So potentially they're not chronically homeless. So potentially we could serve know. 200, but we couldn't serve any of that population of Kakako, potentially. But that, okay. That but population is also shelter eligible. Mm -hmm. well, why are they not in the shelter then? That's a choice, and that's the hard part about working with this population. I think you know that from your experience. You know, they do have to make a personal choice to want to accept the help that we're offering to them. But what are we doing to convince them that it's not the right choice? We have outreach contracts out there every day. I know, but it seems like the population is growing every single day. I mean, I go there quite frequently, and it seems we're having more and more. And the concern is we have, it seems that it's more and more families are moving out to Kaka'ako, you know, which is pretty much the predominate the areas. It's becoming a safe and healthy uh, health hazard, not just for the businesses and the individuals who frequent that area, but the families who also reside there, the very homeless families, they're at great risk. I understand that. I also understand they have capacity in the pub state public housing um, inventory for units. So our outreach workers are out there all the time. Waikiki Health and I IHS both work that area. You know, in your response, you say you're not at liberty to discuss other potential um, initiatives that the administration has discussed. But, you know, that's very uh, uh, convenient for you, but inconvenient for this body in the sense that we need to consider these measures. I can appreciate that. I, what I can tell you is, you know, we all know there's a whole spectrum of solutions out there. Housing First is one of many. And in our internal discussions, we're looking at anything and everything that we can, we can, we can do. I don't have anything concrete to give you a commitment on, so I don't think it would be fair to s I'm not going to put myself on record of saying we're going to do X when we're still not solid on some of the solutions. So would your position be it be okay for us to hold off on these measures until you have something concrete? I think we have enough concrete options to ask you to move forward on this and add it as a tool to our toolbox. So to, to, to move these forward with the, with the understanding that potentially we only can serve 100 individuals? Council member, it's a function of funding Council as well. Council Chair. I'm sorry, excuse me, Council Chair. Um, we ask you for your support to put this as a tool in our toolbox. What other tools? I mean, that's, that's, that's my question. What other tools are we considering? We have Shelter Plus Care vouchers out there. We have Section 8 vouchers out there. We just opened up our wait list for Section 8. You know, when we talk about the capacity of housing, when one unit becomes available for another, there's, there's a move. There's capacity out there. We opened up our, um, we just issued 120 vouchers in our Section 8 program. So there's additional capacity. We're getting ready to take names off of that list, the 14,000 applicants that we have. Um, I just read the, don't know the date on it, but within the next 60 days, they're going to start going through more of those applications and issuing more vouchers. All of that stuff provides for capacity. So the 125 Section 8 vouchers that you're opening, so homeless individuals and families have priority placement for those 125 vouchers? No, they don't. So potentially none of them are going to be accommodated by the 125, right? True or not true? The 125 are targeted for the chronically homeless. That is correct. So they have a preference? It is a different population. That is correct. So there is a preference. But when we talk about using the sit-lie ordinance as a tool, we don't know that every person that we're affecting is chronically homeless. They could be someone who is eligible for shelter or for some of the other programs that are out there. I think that analogy is not apples to apples. Okay. Well, I don't think a lot of the responses are very definitive, uh, Zoning Chair. Yeah, are we considering uh, a potential place of safe refuge as one of the alternatives? It is something that has always been on the table as an option. So that it, that is being discussed within the administration? It has always been considered as something on the table, finding the details and uh, locating and so all the... So yes, your response is yes. Have we identified any potential sites? No. No potential sites? Nothing definitive. Are we working with the state as to whether they have potential sites that we can consider? I personally have not had those conversations. I don't know if anyone else has. Who, who is the lead person from the city working with the state? Mr. Yang has most of the conversations with the so providers. June, have you discussed this with the state? 
Uh, not in that manner, no, with, with locations. So we, we, haven't, we haven't coordinated with the state? No, I've talked with um, our, uh, the, I've talked with some members of, uh, in, this, in this state to, to see what is available, um, and we, we still haven't gotten any, any further than that. But let me ask you this then. Is the state willing to consider a place of safe refuge as an alternative, an immediate emergency initiative? We don't have that, that answer yet. So, Chair, so they, they're not even answer. not even on their radar. Well, that answer they they haven't given us a, a definitive answer yet. Okay, I'm just, I'm just going to end it at this point, Chair, and allow Councilmember Fukunaga mm -hmm. to ask your question. But Chair, uh, I, I wanted to speak on one thing, um, that through the effort in the coordinated coordinated effort through our Hale Omalama, we have talked about uh, what are our resources available to us, especially for our chronically homeless and for our homeless families. Um, and can we provide, um, can we change or, or allow some of our programs that are uh, established today to help uh, target populations like the chronically homeless individuals to come off the streets? So when we look at Shelter Plus Care, which has been around for, I think, about two decades, um, can we use those vouchers for those who need it the most, uh, those who have the highest vulnerability through our assessments? And the shelter, the shelter plus care providers have all volunteered and said yes, they would. Uh, for any of those units that are coming online through attrition, they would then take chronically homeless individuals from the community assessment um, over those who uh, they've traditionally have, have um, housed, which have been, those may be a little bit easier to uh, serve and house in the past. Okay, well, thank you. Let me ask you one follow-up question, if you don't mind. Procedure. I know we taught our great relationship with the state. So, based on your working relationship with the state, being that you're the city's point person on this particular matter, this council appropriated approximately 50, well, close to $50 million for this particular issue. How much did the state appropriate last year? They, for their housing first, did 1.5 million and another million dollars, I believe. So 2.5 million. Uh, approximately. So 5% of what this council appropriated. They've also, uh, in, they were able to increase the rental housing trust fund. So this council and, and by your own representation by the administration deemed this as a crisis because the fact that it is a crisis, we appropriated close to $50 million mm -hmm. to try to remedy this issue or address this issue doesn't seem like the state feels it's, it's a crisis from their level with the 2.5 million dollar appropriation so somehow the, that lines of communication seem to be cloudy would you agree I don't can't, agree I can't I can't respond <laughs> don't agree because then you'll have a bad working relationship no, I, I, with the state I can't I'll answer respond for to you no comment I'll but agree thank you thank you chair um, I'm done Mr. Yang, yes. uh, or uh, Director Oakland, or uh, Managing Direct, uh, Deputy Managing Director okay. Deemer, thank you very much for joining the discussion. Thank you, Chair. Has the state been approached to assist with providing land, at least on a temporary basis? Temporary meaning perhaps an 18-month basis uh, to help to be able to place people until we can get a Housing First initiative uh, affordable housing to assist working homeless or affordable housing to assist families in place so at least people have somewhere to go now. Have we had those discussions with the state? Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to say that um, we agree with the um, committee's assessment that having available uh, shelter or housing is an issue in relation to these bills, um, which is why we started with a smaller a geographic area in Waikiki. Um, but we do recognize that there is, that is a problem and we are looking at many different options. Um, we're, and we are talking to the state in partnership as well. Uh, we're just not allowed to uh, give you these details because it's a little premature um, and uh, we'd like to um, get further along before we come to you and provide you with uh, more information. Because we don't want to, you know, misrepresent or, or talk prematurely at this point. But we do understand you know, and agree with your concern. Well, it's not just a concern. Uh, we need to make sure we have something 
yes, in place. Exactly. Uh, so you're asking us to take a leap of faith, pass these out, and just trust that you folks well, are working with the state and trust their commitment. Or, uh, or let, let me just, mm -hmm. and okay. no offense to you, uh, Managing Director, I'm not willing to, at this point, uh, take the state's word on this or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen the state not willing to provide much cocoa at all in the effort of affordable housing, housing first, assisting the homeless. They've left the heavy lifting to the city and county of Honolulu to do this. And we need to hear from them exactly what they're doing. It would help if you could at least tell us that you're having discussions with them. If they haven't committed, then please say they haven't committed. I think that's okay for us to know that. But we do need to know whether or not the Caldwell administration has at least approached the Abercrombie administration to ask for access to land, to ask for access to resources in the form of the Department of Health, Department of Human Services. Have these discussions at least taken place? Um, yes, they have taken place. It's just that we do not have a commitment at this point. Okay, so we don't have a commitment from the administration at the state level on anything? They're still in discussion. We're still in discussions. But um, may I, if I may add, Chair, um, the, that, that is the reason why we are asking for the for Bill 42 to go forward at the very least because we do feel that there is housing shelter space available for the chronically homeless within that geographic area. Um, we obviously can't say the same thing for a broader geographic area. Let me ask this, is the Caldwell administration uh, considering city properties that may be, may be available to house folks on a temporary basis until what you have in mind with the comprehensive homeless plan comes online? We have been. Uh, I, I think Mr. Uh, Yang and others in the um, managing director's office have been looking for potential city property sites that, that may be used for various and, purposes. And what types of services would be offered on these city properties, Director Yang? Well, um, we're, we want to make sure that everybody going through these type of places, um, in, in our internal discussions, we're talking about ensuring that they will be connected to services. Okay connected to Housing First, uh, connected to all the resources that are available to us. But what type of housing opportunities would these be? Would these be uh, temporary shelters? Uh, what, are, what exactly are we looking at? Uh, at this point, we're, we're looking at every option available to us uh, that's available, yes. At this uh, point. What would we be able to implement most quickly? Potential um, facilities mm -hmm. that city facilities that may be used for housing, um, if there is land available, um, you know, in terms of things that we might be able to put on those, on that property. Um, we're, we're trying to be as creative as possible in terms of looking at what's available to us and what could be um, creatively used for housing options. Is the administration considering anything similar to what Mayor Fossey implemented in the 1990s at Alla Park? As a... Uh, I'm not asking if Alla Park is being considered. Yeah. What I'm asking is, is the administration looking at a temporary solution such as was implemented by Mayor Fossey at Alla Park at any of the properties that the city owns? Um, I can tell you that that... Um, you're talking about a, a safe zone situation, so, uh, something like that. Call it that certainly, you know, during the, the um, time that the administration has been in office, we've looked at various alternatives, and we have looked at that one. It, it has some potential um, difficulties to it, but we, we certainly have looked at that. So, so you have looked at it, meaning you're not looking at it anymore? I think it's still on the table. Still on the table being considered or still on the table as we discussed it and still on the not table that as a as an option. Okay. Uh, Council Member Kobayashi, followed by Council Member Fukunaga. Thank you very much, Deputy Manager Director. Thank you. Following up on that, um, I have other questions. But following since we're discussing which city properties are you looking at? Of what have you narrowed it down to? Um, you know, I, I don't have a, a list of those, but I think um, I don't know. Mr. Yang, if you can clarify, but we've actually uh, looked at the, um, through our 
real property division looked at um, potential city sites that right you've said mm -hmm. that so I, I wondered but which uh, ones are has it been narrowed down to or do we still have the island all city owned properties or have you narrowed it down I don't know if we've narrowed it down. Maybe uh, Mr. Yang has more at, at this point, um, I think it's a little, uh, we're still looking at the urban areas. We're looking in, in areas around, um, we're still exploring what sites would be um, well suited for something of that. Of so this what site. are the top three? We don't have that yet. Okay, and you said Aalo Park has some difficulties, uh, potential difficulties. What are those? Uh, I, I didn't. I don't. I didn't say that. Oh, what are the potential difficulties? Well, um, I think that uh, safety is a, a a concern. Safety. Yes, safety within. Okay, but isn't that a concern for whatever property? That is correct. Okay. Um, last year, you uh, the administration had a press conference talking about the launching of uh, Housing First. So how many um, units have you um, provided since that uh, conference last, the press conference last year? The press conference last year announced the Homeless Action Plan. Right. And was... I think you were going to do 25 um, units per year. That plan had indicated the hoppy income as being mm -hmm. the, I'm sorry, the CDBG no, program it, income as its source of funding. Not, not that, not for this one. Y yes, ma'am, I beg to differ. That report referenced the program income from CDBG and the home as the this funding source. This was early source. in the administration. Mm -hmm. That's correct. It was in mm -hmm. May of 2013. Mm -hmm. And we had anticipated the program income from the sale of the city's portfolio to fund it. When that did not happen, the program has not been funded until this FY15 so, budget. But had you identified at least 25 uh, landowners that would take the Housing First clients? Not specifically, no. As I mentioned earlier, we have a group of but now providers. You have the, now you have the, the money, not from the Hoppy sale. Um, I believe it's about $8 million that you wanted for Housing First. So at, at least if you started looking for potential landlords last year, um, do you have a list this year? Is that list still available? The proposal was to rent units, not to purchase right, units. Right, exactly. And we were dependent upon the providers who mm -hmm. have existing relationships in the community with building owners mm -hmm. to use their resources to right. find those units. Exactly. No one received a contract, so no, they did not commit any specific units to the city's program. But do you have some in mind? You already have, must have a list of the providers. Because it's very difficult to 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 find uh, landlords that would especially uh, because you're concentrating on housing first clients that's correct and mm -hmm. we need to appeal to their moral conscience because that right. is the only it's not just factor. homeless but housing first clients that's correct that's the difficulty mm -hmm. and um, because you know uh, chair always mentions the Kakaako near the medical school mm -hmm. how many homeless children are there in that point in time count that I, I can't give you that number uh, right now I can come back to the to the, the committee was it less than a hundred less than 500 or h how many that should be I mean you know having homeless children should be a, a big concern so we don't know how many homeless children there are. Are in in the Kakaoka area, area? No, I don't. Well, not just not just in the Kakaoka area, then anywhere. You can you get us that number if Absolutely. you don't have it? I you don't even that. have an estimate. No, I don't have that estimate. Um, because you're the housing director, and we have those twelve Hoppy projects mm -hmm. that we are probably not going to sell. We've said that already. So, and there, we were told by the administration that there are vacancies in those units. So is there, have you been looking at our own, since you're looking at city properties, have you looked at those also? 
Yes, we have considered our own inventory as a potential inventory that would be available. That is correct. And what have you decided? We haven't decided yet. We, haven't, we don't have a contract out yet, but we do know that there are certain properties that have vacancies if they are in the target areas. We've had this conversation, I think, at the committee mm -hmm. here, that certainly our properties would be potential properties. Right. Because there's such a, I mean, if it, this is a crisis mode, a priority, um, you know, you'd think you'd have something sort of, something in mind. And the 125 that have become available through the, um, the rental assist, the uh, section eight, I guess. You said those, the priority would be given to the chronically homeless? No, we didn't say that. I well, said will they be? No, they will not be. So how are we gonna, so why did you mention the 125? Because I talked about the capacity of rental units within the community. There is an existing. Yeah, we always have that. Yeah. That's correct. Because your, tr your priority though is the chronically homeless. Well, our department works all of those programs. I mean, your administration, so then, I should say. Your priority is Housing First. Specific to the Housing First uh, initiative, uh, the focus for that population is the chronically homeless individuals, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, we're, we're concerned about the chronically homeless, but we're, I in particular, well, and I know Chair is too, very concerned about the homeless children. If you see them playing out on the street, I, I you know, do. it's just gets to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Fukunaga. Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps, you know, um, some of the uh, things that the council has worked on in conjunction with the administration can help address the questions that have come up today. Um, you know, with respect to some of the um, Housing First initiatives as well and um, questions that came up about those chronic homeless that have severe mental health or other substance abuse problems. Um, I know that we have had a number of discussions with providers, with community members that also included um, representatives from the city administration as well as state administration. And I understand that uh, Department of Community Services has had some discussions with service providers who are seeking to expand their services in the downtown Honolulu and Chinatown area. Is that accurate? That is accurate. We have a, we're in a procurement process right now with Mental Health Kokoa okay. to expand their safe haven capacity in Chinatown. Okay. Um, it is my understanding further that, um, you know, the uh, Mental Health Kokoa program has made a presentation to the Downtown Neighborhood Board this past month. They did seek support from the board and the community for an expanded safe haven program temporarily in the Chinatown area, partly um, to accommodate those folks who are currently on the streets and who are making it very difficult for residents and businesses, you know, to um, survive, you know, during this very tough economic time. And I believe um, um, in those discussions, they have also mentioned that they have had a number of discussions with city administration folks as well as state administration folks. Are you aware of that? Yes, ma'am. They pro provided us with an unsolicited proposal. We are in the middle of a pro sole source procurement. I'm reluctant to get into the details of it because of the procurement process has a time frame on it. Um, but yes, you are correct. They have approached the city to relocate and expand their program within Chinatown. So I, I guess, you know, to answer a number of the questions that, you know, have been raised, um, some of the funding that has been included in the city budget is intended to help facilitate and to assist the city in serving those chronic homeless individuals who may have severe mental health and other kinds of challenges, as well as work with the um, state administration on um, a law that was passed uh, last year, mm -hmm. the uh, Act 221, mm -hmm. you know, assisted community treatment type of programs using various providers. And it is my understanding that the businesses have been working very closely with homeless providers and others, city administration and state administration folks, to see how quickly those individuals who do need medical treatment can be assisted in um, moving off the street, but to use some form of uh, housing that is going to be uh, secure and which will provide them with the kind of 24-7 and other kind of support that will help really uh, relieve the community of some kind of pressure. Is that 
um, something that you're also aware of? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I would like to speak on just a, a little bit uh, related to that. The um, Act 221 is, uh, it provides a, the community a tool to uh, help those who um, have mental illness um, be able to uh, get into resources. Right now, many of our mental ill who are on the street uh, may be connected with some case management. Uh, and the way that the, the contracts are, it's a very limited um, resource for the, the mentally ill on the street. Um, I think it's something like three hours a month. What we are able to do uh, through the state SAMHSA grant is connect these individuals who are chronically, Ill, uh, chronically homeless with uh, severe mental illness uh, and have a case manager or case uh, uh, services connected to that individual uh, on a more intense, uh, with a lot more time together. Because we, we see um, many of our chronically homeless uh, and mentally ill on the street here around, around the Halle as well. And uh, having access to those service providers is uh, very limited at this point. So Act 221 and the uh, state SAMHSA grant will allow uh, for more resources to the, this population. So I guess, you know, I, I, I just wanted to add that, you know, there have been efforts within a specific uh, set of geographical areas and for certain populations to supplement, you know, what has been proposed by the city administration and that with state assistance as well as city assistance, you know, I do think that we can make a real meaningful uh, difference. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's hard to say in the context of a very broad housing first, you know, set of discussions, but I think progress can be made if we all put our respective efforts together. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to move to Council Member Menor. Few brief questions. Um, I wanted to get your, your comments, Deputy Director, in regards to uh, the proposed uh, CD1 that's been offered by uh, Councilmember Harimoto to Bill 42. I know the administration's position is you'd like to you'd like it to take effect immediately. Uh, however, Councilmember Harimoto has expressed concerns that apparently other council members have in regards to whether uh, we would have sufficient time to be able to find the sufficient and necessary bed spaces or shelter spaces. Excuse me. Uh, to be able to accommodate the homeless who, who may have to relocate out of um, Waikiki. Um, I think that's an especial, especially um, important concern given the fact that if um, the uh, statute were to be challenged uh, in court, the uh, uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has indicated that the uh, city and county is going to have to establish that uh, there are sufficient bed, uh, shelter spaces available. So uh, again, I know the administration has taken the position that you'd like the uh, measure to take effect immediately, but as a compromise, as a possible middle ground, um, do you think it might be prudent for us to um, perhaps de to delay the effective date slightly to January 1st, 2015, to ensure that the uh, city will have adequate time to uh, find the, the sufficient and necessary shelter spaces? Um, thank you, Council Member Menor. At this point in time, we do believe there is sufficient shelter space for the chronically homeless in Waikiki. So we would like to ask the council to, um, to, sti to stick with the original um, uh, bill in terms of an effective date upon approval as opposed to the January 1, 2015 date. Okay, but so those shelter spaces are those that were uh, discussed and referred to uh, by, uh, by the directors uh, in response to previous questions? Uh, their shelter, temporary shelter that don't necessarily, is not necessarily within Waikiki. Um, it could be outside Waikiki. We have approximately, um, just in the urban Honolulu area, uh, uh, anywhere from uh, 60 to uh, close to 100 shelter spaces uh, on any given week. Um, I see. So you're confident that uh, those shelter spaces would accommodate uh, homeless uh, individuals uh, who uh, may be impacted by Bill 42 if it were enacted into law? In, in the Waikiki area, um, the, the population uh, would we'd be able to house the uh, or shelter the, the homeless individuals on the street. Vice Chair Harimoto, uh, I'd like the follow-up questions to be very brief, please, because I would like to move to public testimony. Yes, understood. Thank you. 
Okay, now I'm really confused with this. I think earlier in my questioning, we clearly established that the chronic homeless in Waikiki really have nowhere to go because the chronic homeless with severe mental and substance abuse issues cannot be taken in to existing traditional shelters. And they were talking about traditional shelters having 100 spaces. But these are not places that the mm -hmm. chronic homeless, meaning severe mental capacity issues or severe substance abuse issues, can be accepted into because of the rules. So where did I miss? No, the um, council member, um, not every person who is homeless in Waikiki has severe that. mental illness or substance that. abuse. Um, we have a, a large population of who are not considered chronically homeless. That. Uh, and for those with mental illness or substance abuse, it does not preclude them from coming into shelter at all. Traditional shelters. Yes, the traditional emergency shelters. So, so someone if they were, if somebody were to walk into Next Step Shelter uh, and have substance abuse issues, uh, they would be asked not to use in the shelter. But if they came in having, uh, let's say, they have been drinking, uh, it would not be something that would say that you've been you are 86 from the property. You're no longer allowed into the property. Right, I understand that, but that's the crux of the matter, right? These people cannot help themselves. If they're told you can't come in if you're inebriated or on drugs or whatever, they can't go in. I'm not saying that they cannot go in because they are, they are drunk or they are uh, on drugs. They can still access the shelter to sleep in and to, to stay in, uh, but they cannot use while in the shelter. Okay, but that's, that's, that really is the crux of the issue. Because they cannot help themselves. They cannot control what they're doing. They need help. And, and that's why they're not in the shelters, right? I mean, that, that's the whole issue we're talking about. And, and the, shelters, the shelter is the, the appropriate place for, for many people to access these services because that is the first entry point for many of the individuals who are on the street to, to have access to uh, SNAP benefits, medical, medical benefits. Okay, yeah. So this, I, I, I still agree that the shelter is the right place for people to get to the resources that they need because it's very difficult uh, otherwise. Okay. I'm not an expert on this, but I totally disagree. If that's true, then why are we going with Housing First? Why the, the, the $47 million for Housing First, if what you're saying is true? For accessing that's, resources. That's contrary to everything that we've been told earlier. No, for accessing resources to be connected to these benefits, for a homeless individual who is, who is coming into homelessness, this is the place that our system has created, our, our island-wide system, and not just here in, in Honolulu or Hawaii. It is just a national practice that all of, our, all of the homeless shelters and programs are connected together. Um, so for, for our system here, traditionally, for someone to be able to access SNAP benefits, food, sta uh, food stamps, general welfare, um, and uh, access to housing, uh, people have had to go into uh, a place like IHS or Next Step to be able to get uh, someone to work with them, a counselor or case manager. Regarding Housing First, what we are doing within our resources now is working with service providers to go out into the street so that they can find the individuals and be able to bring them into housing. That's what, this is a whole change in, in philosophy to be able to bring the resources to them. But that's for, specifically for a chronically homeless, the resource that's available to them is Housing First. For those who are not uh, chronically homeless, uh, to be able to access the, the traditional uh, housing resources, the mainstream resources that are out there, uh, through the assessments, through the case managers going out in the street, they will be able to connect people to give them information. We'll, we'll be able to help you over here at, at Waikiki Health Center or at case, you know, Caravan or IHS or Waianae uh, Community Outreach or Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center or U.S. Vets. You'll have to come over here or we'll try to get you someone to you to get these benefits, to get these resources, to get your information down into the system. Because there is no roving HMIS system. There is no roving. It, we don't have that capacity at this point. So for a homeless individual at this point, still today, they will still have to go into uh, a, a brick and mortar shelter or a provider there to get that uh, connection made. But for Housing First, what we're trying to do is, is 
reach out and get into the streets to find those who are chronically homeless and match them up with the resources. But even those individuals will have to go into a brick and mortar shelter or provider to get all the rest of the information uh, put into the system so they, they can get connected to the housing and the resources as well. Okay, I, like I said, I'm not the expert, but I, 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 either we've been misled earlier or I just disagree with what's being, being said now. But with that said, I think we seriously need to, need to take a second look at $47 million that we're pumping into housing first. So I, I, we'll have this discussion offline. I, I'm not clear at all. I think we're oversimplifying the issues related to the traditional housing, and I totally disagree. Uh, but with that said, Mr. China, we're, we're in a timeline. But uh, since we talked about the um, um, possibility of looking at these um, safe haven shelters, um, safe zones, or whatever we want to call it, um, I just want to be real clear that if the administration goes down that path, uh, I'm going to be equally opposed to that also. Because I really think that's not a solution that's kicking the can down the road. And once we have it, why should we invest money into real solutions? And I really think that's the wrong thing to do. So I'll just warn you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, we're going to move into our public uh, testimony.